Okay, let's now turn to Julius Caesar and see if I'm right that these plays actually work together. Uh, and a good way of seeing that is just to turn to the opening scene of Julius Caesar. Uh, in some ways, you can understand everything uh, that has happened to Rome since Coriolanus in this opening scene. Uh, the two scenes seem to be written as companions, as if Shakespeare were trying to link these two scenes together. As in the first scene of Coriolanus, we've got a crowd of plebeians here, we've got a couple of tribunes dealing with them, and the issue is a great man. Uh, but things have fundamentally changed. Uh, in Coriolanus, the people hated the great man, the great warrior, the man then Caius Martius, soon to be Coriolanus. Uh, and the tribunes, when they're appointed, at most channel that hatred uh, into an acceptable political form of banishment. Uh, but here, uh, the people are flocking after the equivalent of Coriolanus, in this case, Julius Caesar, a great military leader, uh, and the tribunes are trying to dissuade the people of their support for Caesar. So immediately you can see uh, that the worst nightmare of the Roman Republic has come true. Just what I was pointing to uh, uh, last time, that the biggest problem for uh, the Roman Republic would be if the people ever got too attached to one of these patricians, uh, if they ever accepted one-man rule and indeed clamored for it. So we really see here in the opening scene uh, what is going to bring down the Republic uh, and uh, produce one-man rule uh, in Rome. And we also, I think, get more than just hints of what's brought it about. Uh, and I'll just begin with the first line of the play, hence home, you idle creatures, get you home. The Roman plebeians are now idle. They were not idle in Coriolanus. They were on the brink of starvation. Uh, they were people operating under the pinch of necessity, pushed to their limits because they were out f without food. Uh, they were storming around the city uh, in desperation. Now they're having a holiday. Uh, <laughs> Uh, uh, and it suggests that in some way the idleness of the plebeians is the clue to the decadence of Rome. Uh, uh, that, that pressure of necessity ultimately kept them in line in the early days of the Republic and throughout much of its history. Now this is a flattered uh, 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 urban proletariat, we would call it, uh, people uh, who uh, are at least relatively well off. The plebeians of Coriolanus are decidedly poor. But now, notice about line seven, this is all on page three, uh, what dost thou with thy best apparel on? Now, that's an interesting touch there. Uh, these plebeians now have a change of clothes. Uh, I suspect the plebeians of Coriolanus did not. Indeed, I would love to get a chance to stage these plays uh, sometime uh, and, you know, have the plebeians in Coriolanus come out in rags. Uh, and now in Julius Caesar, have them pretty well dressed up. Uh, and indeed, this is a more advanced economy, we would say. Uh, I talked about the division of labor in connection with Aristotle. And here you see that we now have trades in Rome. We have carpenters, we have cobblers. Uh, in Coriolanus, uh, it was not clear what these plebeians did. Uh, but now we're at a more advanced state. We are 450 years later. Uh, uh, and so we see a wealthier group of plebeians. Indeed, historically, many plebeians grew quite wealthy through trade. Uh, 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 and moreover, we could notice, it seems, a different relation between the tribunes and the plebeians here. They don't seem to know uh, the plebeians individually. Uh, uh, what trade art thou? I get the feeling in Coriolanus that Sicinius and Brutus wouldn't have to ask the plebeians what trade they are because they know, all know each other. And here, uh, 
uh, indeed, Rome had grown much larger by now. Uh, it's now a city of maybe a million people. Uh, uh, it was in the thousands at the time of Coriolanus. Uh, and so we see a community uh, that is uh, uh, much more, with people more distant uh, from each uh, other in it. Uh, and above all, we see a change in the relation uh, of the plebeians uh, to uh, this one great patrician, Julius Caesar. If you'll turn to page 4, which will be around line 35 in this first scene. Morellus's speech, Wherefore rejoice, what conquest brings he home, what tributaries follow him to Rome, to grace and captive bonds his chariot wheels, you blocks, you stones, you worse than senseless things, O oh, you hard hearts, you cruel men of Rome, knew you not Pompey. And in case you can't figure out the situation here, Julius Caesar is celebrating a Roman triumph over a fellow Roman general, Pompey the Great. Not so great anymore. Uh, uh, and this is a real turn. Now, historically, it was a turn. It's a very questionable move uh, on Caesar's part. Uh, uh, a, a Roman general was supposed to celebrate a triumph over foreigners. Uh, you conquered the Gauls, you conquered the Spaniards, you conquered the Thracians. Uh, uh, but this triumph is the product of a civil war. Uh, and it shows how the Republic is destroying itself through internal conflict. Uh, now you see what a Roman general was supposed to do, what conquest brings he home, what tributaries follow him to Rome. These triumphs traditionally so, uh, uh, celebrated great Roman victories that brought enormous amounts of wealth to Rome. Uh, uh, huge shipments of grain, often you know, piles of gold and silver, and so on. Uh, so Rome was enriched over the centuries, uh, but now the consequence of that is that one Roman patrician is celebrating a triumph over another. So again, if you just look at this scene, you can see what ultimately brought down uh, the Republic. It is the triumph of one patrician over all the others, and he accomplished that by getting the plebeians on his side. Uh, now, any questions about that? Okay, <laughs> let me give you another one of my pint-sized Roman history lessons, because uh, we're making quite a jump here from roughly 494 B.C. to 44 B.C. That's 450 years. Now, I know to you the difference between 494 B.C. and 44 B.C. You know, may not sound like much. Think uh, 450 years ago, that's 1652. Uh, 1562, yeah. In 1562, uh, uh, there was no United States. Believe it or not, there wasn't even a Harvard in 1562. Uh, uh, and in fact, Shakespeare hadn't even been born in 1562. It's two more years. That's, uh, in those terms, you see, that's a long chunk of history, 450 years. Uh, and uh, so a lot happened between the days of Coriolanus uh, and the days uh, of Julius Caesar. And let me just give you a very rough sense of it so you'll understand why the Roman uh, Republic uh, is teetering on the brink of becoming uh, an empire here. Uh, we talked about this a bit. Uh, Rome started out as just one city among many on Italy, not a particularly prominent one. Uh, it gradually conquered all the other peoples uh, uh, in what is now Italy. Uh, and uh, a very interesting thing about the Romans, they tended to ad admit the people they conquered to Roman citizenship. Uh, so it's not that Rome ruled over all the other cities in Italy as foreign possessions. Rather gradually, and again, this was very complicated and in stages, but gradually the peoples of Italy became citizens of Rome. And in general, over the centuries, the Romans incorporated the people they conquered into Roman citizenship. Uh, it's a different attitude towards conquest than many people uh, 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 have manifested when they've created empires. Uh, so uh, the Romans you know, conquered the Samnites and then uh, started expanding around the Mediterranean. It's, the, the famous gladiator shows embody memories of these conquests. Some of the categories of the gladiators 
uh, were people dressed as some of the foreign people that the Romans uh, had conquered. There was a Samnite kind of a gladiator. There was a Gaul type of gladiator. There was a Thracian type of gladiator. Those gladiator images you have in some ways uh, are memories of Rome's conquest of all these people. In its expansion around the Mediterranean, uh, the major power Rome uh, encountered was Carthage, uh, and they had a series of what are called the Punic Wars. Uh, Carthage almost won. We could all be speaking Phoenician today uh, if Hannibal had marched on Rome when he had his, sh- his chance at it. Uh, uh, but uh, uh, as its main rival, once, Car- once Carthage was destroyed, uh, uh, Rome was in, pretty much in control of the Mediterranean, uh, eventually went and conquered uh, the Greek people, uh, all of what we call the Middle East, eventually Spain. Caesar conquered much of what's now France. And Anyway, Rome put together this huge empire. And always remember there, Rome had an empire before it became an imperial regime. In some ways, we're, what we're looking at is how having an empire generated an imperial regime uh, in Rome. It's not that they started out with an emperor and then got an empire. It's really rather interesting that they started out with an empire and then got an emperor, and that's in a way exactly the process we're tracing uh, uh, here. Uh, Now, uh, in a way, what I'm talking about is the tragedy of the Roman Republic, uh, that the very uh, things that made it great, the very conquests it made, eventually subverted the Republican regime. Uh, And it did so in several ways, and this is the important background I want to give you for understanding uh, uh, Julius Caesar. Uh, uh, As Rome grew larger, certain of the Republican institutions did not function anymore. And the chief one was this one-year limit on being consul. Uh, Just think about it. When When you're marching an army from Rome, the city of Rome, to say Madrid or or to Damascus. Uh, It takes maybe a year just to get there. Uh, And as the Roman campaigns grew longer, uh, the temptation grew very great uh, to to extend the military commands. And most historians of Rome, including Machiavelli, uh, attribute the ultimate subversion of the Republic to the prolongation of the military commands. This is in the discourses uh, in Book 3, Chapter 24. Uh, The prolongation of commands made Rome servile. Uh, This is on page 269 of your edition. If one considers well the proceeding of the Roman Republic, one will see that two things were the cause cause of the dissolution of the Republic. One was the contentions that arose from the agrarian law, and I'll say something about that in a few minutes. The other, the prolongation of commands. And Machiavelli goes on uh, to to say, uh, uh, for, for the further, this is now on page 270, for the farther the Romans went abroad with arms, the more such extensions appeared necessary to them, and the more they used it. That thing produced two inconveniences. One, that a lesser number of men were practiced in commands, and because of this they came to restrict reputation to a few. The other, that when a citizen remained commander of an army for a very long time, he would win it over to himself and make it partisan to him, for the army would in time forget the Senate and recognize that head. Because of this, Sulla and Marius could find soldiers who would follow them against the public good. Because of this, Caesar could seize the fatherland. Uh, uh, I really recommend Book 3, Chapter 4 of the discourses to you. Uh, I know it's tempting only to read the opening chapters, but read the whole book. There's some great stuff in it. Uh, uh, And here you see the problem. Uh, And it developed uh, about a century and a half after Coriolanus. Uh, The first prolongation of a command was in 327 B.C. Uh, And you see, the genius of the Republic was the two consuls every year. That left you with a lot of people who had major executive experience in the community. Uh, I believe the commands were never extended more than five years, but even five years is a long time, both in the sense is that uh, it, re- it reduces the number, instead of having five great generals in five years, you have only one. Uh, 
and it also allows the soldiers to become loyal to that one man uh, and not to the Senate uh, that has uh, appointed him. Uh, and uh, most historians in Rome see this uh, as the turning point in the Republic. Now, again, it didn't happen overnight. They prolonged a the command beginning in 327 B.C., and they lasted still to 44 B.C. or 27 B.C. or 31 B.C., however you want to date the beginning of the, the imperial regime. Uh, it was a gradual process. Uh, at first, it was seen as temporary measure. It gradually became more and more common to prolong the commands, and that's how you start to get these figures like Judas Caesar and Pompey the Great, who have been generals for long periods of time and have been running the same group of soldiers uh, for year after year. The other aspect to this is how wealthy these generals became. Because when they conquered a province and were appointed a so-called proconsul to run the province, they were essentially the tax collectors. Uh, and they, to some extent, brought that money back to Rome, but the money was chiefly used uh, to finance the army. Uh, and the way the soldiers looked at it, that general, whether he be Julius Caesar or uh, Pompey was the source of your income as a soldier. That guy was paying you either through conquered booty uh, or through taxes. Uh, and moreover, the, these generals uh, uh, would give land to their, to their veterans. Uh, uh, so when they left the army, what they would get in return for that was a gift of land from their general. So you can see this is why uh, Caesar is in such a strong position uh, in Shakespeare's play, why people like Cassius and Brutus resented that these generals uh, had enormous power generated from their wealth. It is hard to uh, figure out exactly what a drachma was worth or a talent or whatever these units of money we see uh, in classical uh, references. The way I like to express the wealth uh, of these Ro great Roman generals is essentially these guys could pay the defense budget of their country out of their pocket. Now, Bill Gates, not even close. Uh, with the, uh, he's very wealthy, definitely wealthier than I am. But, 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 but he can't come close to paying the U.S. defense budget. And these guys like Pompey and Julius Caesar could. They essentially were paying the Roman defense budget out of their pocket, and evidently with money to spare. Uh, so look at the logic of this. The, in some sense, the Roman Republic was extremely successful in military terms. It did conquer every army it faced. It was extraordinary in that sense. But the logic of that is you start to have to rely on the generals more. Uh, the very expansion of the empire requires the prolongation of military commands and therefore subverts the original idea between having the two consuls. Uh, moreover, these individual men become so wealthy, it becomes very corrupting to the Roman system. If you read Plutarch's life of Julius Caesar, you will see that he used his wealth, and in some cases borrowed money, uh, in order to corrupt the Roman political system. Uh, uh, they started to use money to buy offices. Uh, Mark Antony is a friend of Julius Caesar. He wants to have him made tribune or something. He, he, uh, Julius Caesar uses money to get the people to vote for Mark Antony, uh, in effect. Moreover, the patricians began to understand that they could get the plebeians on their side uh, by appealing to their appetites. That's what uh, Machiavelli means when he cites the agrarian laws as the other source of problems in Roman history. Uh, that as we can see from Coriolanus, the uh, constant demand uh, of the plebeians was essentially for more food, uh, for more wealth. Uh, and uh, you can see in Coriolanus uh, that he is opposed to that. He, as a patrician, does everything he can, for example, to prevent the distribution of the grain to, pe pe the, to the plebeians. But patricians came along who started to favor the distribution of grain. And indeed, by the time of Julius Caesar, uh, the 
the Roman plebeians were entitled by law to a certain portion of grain uh, that the Roman state would deliver to them from its conquered territories, uh, particularly Egypt at the time of Julius Caesar. Uh, and so this was an enormously corrupting element in Roman politics that the patricians, individual patricians, start buying off the plebeians. They had the great armies in their pocket, and then they started to get the plebeians in their pocket. Uh, they would start to uh, give people uh, more grain and more land. That's the agrarian laws uh, were chiefly land re re redistribution laws that a number of Roman patricians sponsored, largely starting in the second century uh, BC. So that delicate balance that makes the Roman Republic seem to work in Corylands. Gradually, and again, let's give Rome credit because it took four and a half centuries uh, for this to reach the crisis uh, in the regime, but still, gradually, uh, that, that sense of balance of power between the patricians and the plebeians is undermined. The balance of power within the patricians is undermined. Again, the genius of the Republic was let's have lots of patricians who have been consul, who can be general, uh, and we can rely on them. We don't get too reliant on one single patrician. And by the same token, the plebeians will maintain their suspicion of the patricians. That's been overthrown. Now, again, that's a very quick summary of Roman history, but any, any questions about that? Okay, so let's see how that works out in terms of uh, uh, Shakespeare's play. One of the key moments uh, that we hear about uh, at the very beginning uh, uh, is uh, the uh, uh, notion of uh, Casca's report on Julius Caesar, uh, this is page 15, so it's act one, scene two, about line uh, 255 in the play. Remember, Casca is reporting the scene uh, where uh, uh, Mark Anthony is uh, doing a kind of trial balloon here, offering Caesar a crown uh, in public, and what Caesar learns is the people are not prepared yet to get a king. Uh, 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 but we learn that Caesar collapsed and that he did have epilepsy or the falling sickness. Uh, uh, but but Casca tri attributes it uh, uh, to uh, uh, something else here. Uh, this is about line 257 on page uh, 15. Uh, if the tagrag people did not clap him and hiss him according as he pleased and displeased them, as they used to do the players in the theater, I am no, no true man. That's a very telling moment there. Caesar, Julius Caesar's theatricality, because it contrasts sharply with Coriolanus. Remember that what Coriolanus refused to do was to play a part. Uh, he had an almost visceral hatred of acting. Uh, and so he wouldn't give the plebeians the show that they wanted. Uh, as Coriolanus' friends tell him, all you have to do is pretend for a little while that you like that, and you'll be consul. Just put on a show. Uh, and the language is quite theatrical. Perform a part, uh, they say to him. Uh, uh, and he won't do it. But we see, if you will, the genius of Julius Caesar here. Uh, uh, he is indeed stage managing this moment. It's a very theatrical moment. He's staging a scene uh, with Anthony offering the crown because he wants to find out if the Roman people are prepared to have a king. He discovers they're not. But in any case, it's very theatrical. Uh, and in general, what we see in this play is that the patricians have overcome Coriolanus's visceral disgust for the plebeians. In a curious way, uh, uh, the, the, that delicate balance of power in the Republic, in the Republic depends uh, upon uh, uh, a minimal amount of fraternization between the parties. We can have Meninius meeting with Sicinius and Brutus and Coriolanus, but, but in some ways that disdain that Coriolanus shows for the plebeians is necessary to prevent anyone from patrician from enlisting the plebeians on his side, Caesar, in a way, uh, is much more broad-minded than Coriolanus. Uh, he is not captive of those patrician 
uh, notions that the plebeians are simply contemptible. He's willing to play to them. Uh, now, we're going to discuss Antony's speech at length a little later, but I'll just jump to it uh, to show you something of the Caesarian policy. Antony is, uh, in some sense, the apprentice of Julius Caesar here. When you get to that famous Friends Roman Country in speech, you actually see encapsulated in it uh, much of the Caesarian policy. And the thing, again, we'll go into it in greater detail next time, uh, uh, perhaps possibly the third lecture on Julius Caesar. But uh, uh, Antony is tremendously theatrical uh, in that speech. He appeals to the Blupians on a kind of gut level. At a crucial moment, he descends literally to their level. Brutus, as we'll see, one of his problems is he's an old-style patrician. He stands up on the rostrum and keeps his distance. One of the great moments in Antony's speech is when he says, shall I descend to you? And this would probably have been acted out on the Elizabethan stage. If you've ever seen the globe, it has an upper stage and a lower stage. You know, the scene where they do the balcony scene in Romeo and Juliet, in, 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 in Julius Caesar, uh, Antony would start up on the balcony, speaking down to the people, and then he comes to their level. But above all, what does he do uh, to, to clinch that speech? He bears Caesar's wounds in public exactly what Coriolanus would not do. Uh, uh, Coriolanus, in effect, loses the consulship because he won't bear his wounds in an utterly shameless and, quite frankly, disgusting moment. I mean, Antony just uh, flaunts Caesar's wounds to the crowd. I mean, it's a kind of desecration of the body of his best friend, but it shows you uh, uh, this lack of shame Coriolanus is consumed with shame. He won't appear naked in public. He won't, uh, I can kind of understand that actually, but, but he, uh, you know, he won't bear his wounds when he was supposed to. Uh, but uh, uh, in a really marked contrast, Antony is not bound by such a conventional emotion as shame. He, Antony is a deeply shameless man, as we will see in Antony and Cleopatra. But the bearing of those wounds uh, shows how theatrical the Caesarian regime has become and how it's overcome the old patrician prejudices. And, of course, the other thing, the other genius uh, of that speech uh, is the 75 drachmas, Caesar's will. Uh, and again, I think you can use Antony's speech to understand Caesar's policies uh, uh, because Antony understands to clinch the support of the people in his new struggle as he's anticipating with Cassius and Brutus is to get the people on his side and what's the way to do that uh, with uh, a bribe. Uh, this is page 66. So Act 3, Scene 2, about line 243. Here's the will and under Caesar's seal to every Roman citizen he gives to every several man 75 drachmas. And that's when one of the plebeians says, O royal Caesar. That's their notion of royalty, 75 drachmas to every person. That is the price of freedom in Rome. If you want to know what's freedom worth in Rome, it's worth 75 drachmas to these people. Uh, again, it's complicated to know how much that's worth, and I've seen varying reports, but, but the best I can tell, that was one day's wage. Uh, for these Roman plebeians. Uh, so uh, not all that much money. Uh, but again, here's an example of how these Roman patricians were able to use their vast wealth uh, in order to corrupt the people. And then also we learn the top of page 67, so about line 250 in the scene, moreover he hath left you all his walks, his private arbors and new planted orchards on this side Tiber, he hath left them you and to your heirs forever, common pleasures to walk abroad and recreate yourself. Here was a Caesar, when comes such another? Uh, and so this uh, bread and circuses, you all know that, I think, as the formula for the Roman emperors. And you see it here in Caesar as if not the first of the Roman emperors, the one who's going to produce the Roman imperial uh, system. Uh, 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 
you give the people what they want. You perform theatrically. You give them the show they want. You give them money. You give them bread. You give them land. Uh, it really is a kind of pampered populace uh, that is bribed uh, into servitude here. Again, historically, Julius Caesar uh, made a lot of his reputation staging great gladiator shows early in his career. Uh, again, he went into debt in order to buy the best gladiators. Uh, uh, and uh, these people want shows. One of the things I want to trace for you, and it's a very sharp pattern in Shakespeare, is the transformation of the plebeians from citizens to spectators. Uh, in, in Coriolanus, they are still citizens. They are indeed labeled often as first citizen, second citizen, third citizen. They are participating directly in politics. Uh, whether for good or ill, uh, when we see them at the beginning of the play, they are actively pursuing a political uh, agenda there. The, the uh, plebeians in Julius Caesar are on holiday. This is not the kind of serious moment that the opening scene of Coriolanus is. Uh, in fact, they are there to watch something, to watch a big show. And again, it's what these triumphs were. Uh, they'd march through Rome, all sorts of exotic animals they captured somewhere, and, and often the kings they conquered, they marched through, and all the treasure they got. And the plebeians are in the position of spectators. They are watching this thing passively from the sideline. It's indeed what the tribunes are complaining about. That's what the, tr the tribunes in this play represent, in a way, the last gasp of the Republic. It is odd in a way because Coriolanus presents them as the enemies of the Republic. Uh, uh, but we see here that insofar as they could get the people not to attach themselves to single great men, that was what was necessary to the Republic. So page 16 is on, ominous. This is Act 1, Scene 2, uh, about line 285. So Act 1, Scene 2, 285. Morellus and Flavius, for pulling scarfs or Caesar's image, are put to silence. Uh, that's the murder of the tribunes, and it's the last we will ever see tribunes uh, in Shakespeare's Roman plays. Now, in fact, the tribunate survived well into the Republic. It was one of the geniuses of Octavius Caesar to have him Make himself, have himself made tribune, which carried a lot of power, especially uh, to check the will of the Senate. Uh, but as far as Shakespeare is concerned, this is it for tribunes. We will not see them again. Uh, again, historically, that is wrong. The tribune had survived well into the actual Roman Empire. But Shakespeare understands that effectively, Julius Caesar kills the tribunes. Uh, from now on, the tribunes are going to be appointed by the emperors. Sometimes the emperors will have themselves made tribute. And its function of keeping the people from attaching themselves to a great man will be completely subverted, especially by having the tribunate available, in many cases, the emperors himself. So we really are seeing uh, uh, the Roman Republic being taken apart here. Uh, and you get... Uh, you get a wonderful sense in this play of what we to this day often call Caesarism. Uh, it's the man on the horseback, the great military uh, general who offers his conquest as evidence to people of his greatness, who buys them off, who, who uh, uh, doles them out money, who gives them pleasant things that they can enjoy. It's the kind of image that Mussolini followed in fascist Italy. Uh, and uh, it is a, a frightening political logic, uh, and as we see, very successful here. Uh, this is what ultimately subverts uh, uh, the, the republic. And it, it takes a man of legitimate greatness. Uh, again, Shakespeare uh, uh, gives a very complicated... Uh, image of Julius Caesar and shows many faults in him, but I think the premise of the play is still that he is a great man. There's a, a bit of a controversy over the name of this play, uh, Julius Caesar. Julius Caesar is killed in Act 3. Seems a bit odd. It's as if Romeo and Juliet were called Mercutio. Uh, generally speaking, you got to make it to the fifth act in one of Shakespeare's plays to get it named after you, but even Antony doesn't make it past the fourth act. But of course, the point about Caesar, and again, this is something we'll be examining, 
is the fact that his body is killed in Act 3, but the spirit of Caesarism is not. And indeed, one of the great ironies of this play uh, is directly contrary to the intention uh, of the uh, 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 conspirators. They kill the body but liberate the spirit. Brutus says, if we can only uh, kill the spirit and not touch the body. But it's actually just the opposite. Caesar's ghost comes back uh, and indeed uh, presides over uh, the last two acts of the uh, play, as Brutus himself acknowledges. So uh, Caesar is presented as a man who, whose influence uh, goes well beyond his death, and therefore he is presented uh, as a great man. Uh, any questions thus far? Okay, let me talk about some more changes in Rome uh, that we can observe uh, in this play. And I think Shakespeare is really trying to think through uh, uh, the differences between early and very late Republican Rome. I, you know, I should remind you that as far as we can tell, Julius Caesar was written in 1599 and Coriolanus maybe in 1608, 1609. The way I'm approaching these plays, you'd think that Shakespeare wrote Coriolanus first, but he did not. I do think that Shakespeare was capable, having written Julius Caesar, to, to, to set up Coriolanus as a kind of companion play. And so I think uh, the, the correspondences between the, the first scenes in Coriolanus and Julius Caesar are not just an accident, but I feel duty-bound to remind you that some people would think this approach is a bit strange to these plays. But anyway, let's give it a shot. So what else has changed in Rome? Uh, well, religion has changed in very interesting ways. Uh, we now have soothsayers. Uh, we now have this character who comes up with this Beware the Ides of March. Uh, now, there were no soothsayers in Coriolanus, and I made a point of showing you that there are soothsayers in Plutarch's Life of Coriolanus. And it's Shakespeare, I believe, went out of his way to take the soothsayers out of Coriolanus in order to stre stress the self-contained character of the Roman regime. That here was politics that did not have to reach out beyond itself to any source of authority that might lie in private visionaries. Uh, but this is a world of dreamers now. Uh, it's what Caesar first says about the soothsayer. He is a dreamer, let him pass. But notice how powerful uh, Cleopa uh, Cleopa uh, Calpurnia's dream is in this play. Uh, notice that Cinna, the poet, has a dream. Uh, this is a world of dreamers. Now, again, this is still Rome, and it's still technically Republican Rome. It's a city of great soldiers uh, conquering the world. Uh, but something's happening here. Some dimension of life is breaking out in this Rome that was absent in Coriolanus. There aren't dreamers in Coriolanus. People don't have dreams. I showed you that in the source, uh, Valeria, the notion to go, the women, for the women to go visit Coriolanus comes in a vision that a private citizen has. But Shakespeare doesn't keep that in the, put that in the play. He doesn't want in Coriolanus to have a world of dreamy people who have visions. Uh, that go beyond anything the city's telling them. But now we got characters like the soothsayer uh, or Artemidorus. They have sort of private sources of information and they're trying to uh, warn Caesar. Now, he doesn't listen, uh, and of course that uh, 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 results in his death, but still there's this sense something's happening here. And one way I would point uh, you to this fact is in this play, people are changing their minds and in fundamental ways. Uh, Coriolanus is so pig-headed, you can't get that guy to change his mind. It's not that, you know, aristocracy is really great. And then, you know, maybe democracy is not that bad. Maybe we should give democracy <coughs> a, a, a chance. But look at page 32, for example. Uh, this is Act 2, Scene 1. Act 2, scene 1, about line 195. When the cash is trying to figure out whether they, Caesar will come to the Senate this day, for he is superstitious grown of late, quite from the main opinion he held once of fantasy, of dreams, and ceremonies. Uh, 
Caesar's growing superstitious. Now we actually see it's kind of complicated. Some moments he is superstitious, some moments he isn't. But that wavering itself is indicative of something. Uh, here, this very representative Republican Roman, in a way the greatest uh, Rome can produce, he's grown superstitious of late. Then on page 38, so this would be Act 2, Scene 2, uh, near the beginning, about line 13 or 14. Uh, Calpurnia says to Caesar, I never stood on ceremonies, yet now they fright me. Again, someone who has changed her opinion. Uh, uh, and with regard to, as your notes point out, uh, paid attention to omens. Uh, uh, the, the, I showed you in Coriolanus that, that the Romans there didn't really pay that much attention to omens, or they did so in the Machiavellian way. Uh, very little in Coriolanus of their, you know, what do the priests say? Should we go into battle? Very little of that. But in this play, people are starting to worry more uh, about omens. Let me give you one more example. Uh, this is page 92. So Act 5, Scene 1, uh, about line 75. Cash is saying, you know that I held Epicurus strong in his opinion. Now I change my mind. Now we're going to come back to this speech, I think, a couple of times because it's so important here. But I just want you to see the basic point again. This is some guy who subscribed to Epicurus's philosophy, which, by the way, is a form of atheism, or at least the idea that the gods uh, have no interest in human affairs and leave us alone. And now he's saying, I've changed my mind, and he goes on to say, uh, you know, I'm worried about this omen. Uh, so this is, this is uh, a way in which Rome has changed, uh, that uh, people who used to have that kind of uh, pig-headed Roman determination are now worrying about omens and visions and dreams. Uh, it's, it's the cracking of the Roman regime. As I said, in Coriolanus, Rome almost seems to have a roof uh, in it. The city makes such an effort to form the comprehensive horizons of its citizens. Uh, in Julius Caesar, the roof of Rome begins to crack, and indeed there's an enormous eruption in the heavens. Now again, in, in Plutarch's life of Coriolanus, at one point, Castor and Pollux appear in the heavens during a battle. I think it's in connection with the uh, expulsion of the Tarquins. Uh, Shakespeare uh, omits that. But in this play, now Shakespeare is working from a source here. Uh, these storms are in Plutarch. It's not that Shakespeare invented it. But it's always interesting to see what does he take from Plutarch and what, he, what does he leave out. In writing about Coriolanus, he leaves out anything in Plutarch that might suggest the Romans were making reference to the heavens. But in this play, it's really quite strong uh, that the Romans are making reference uh, uh, to the heavens. Uh, and so on page 18, uh, uh, so this is Act 1, Scene 3, uh, we get this tremendous storm. Uh, Casca is frightened by it. Uh, our, uh, this is uh, about line 3 in Act 1, Scene 3. Are you not moved when all the sway of earth shakes like a thing on firm? O Cicero, I have seen tempests when the scolding winds have rived the knotty oaks, and I have seen the ambitious ocean swell and rage and foam be exalted with the threatening clouds. But never till now, tonight, never till now, did I go through a tempest dropping fire. Uh, either there is civil strife in heaven, or else the world, too saucy with the gods, incenses them to send destruction. Uh, so in this play, the Romans do make reference uh, to the heavens. Uh, it's in, in Coriolanus, most of the references are to um, uh, parts of the city. Uh, Meninius in Act uh, 5, you know, uh, see yon coin of the capital, he said. I mean, when he looks up, he still sees a Roman building. Uh, but in Julius Caesar... The Romans look up and they see a, the heavens being torn apart and they react comparably. Uh, uh, Casca is uh, very afraid. Cassius comes along, uh, bottom of page 19, and uses the storm to increase his resolve to stand up uh, to Caesar. Notice, though, Cicero is in this scene. Uh, 
this, to, to my knowledge, this is the only big name philosopher who ever appears as a character in a Shakespeare play. And we'll talk about the presence of philosophy in the play in a minute. Uh, but it's rather interesting that Shakespeare chooses uh, to bring Cicero forward as a character uh, here. Cicero, who was the most important uh, Roman philosopher of this day, but also uh, a wealthy patrician and member of the Senate and a big player in Roman politics at this time, big enough so that Anthony and Octavius have him uh, rubbed out. Uh, and he is strangely taciturn in the scene. Uh, he's brought forward but has very few lines. In fact, most productions tend to save money and eliminate a Cicero uh, uh, here. Uh, uh, but he just asks questions, and then look at his reaction on page 19. Uh, so still Act 1, Scene 3, about line 33. Indeed, it is a strange disposed time, but men may construe things after their fashion, clean from the purpose of the things themselves. Uh, come Caesar to the capital tomorrow. Uh, Cicero is unfazed by these events. Uh, and, and with his talk of the things themselves, he sounds almost Kantian here. Uh, that is, his notion is a very philosophical notion. Uh, 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 in the sense that, say, you know, this is just natural. Uh, you're making a big deal of this. You're trying to read something into it. It's just a storm. It's nothing to be afraid of. Uh, and uh, we may get a hint of Shakespeare's own attitude here in the figure uh, of Cicero. And indeed, what we see here in this play, Rome is trying to orient himself, itself by something outside the political here, but it's strange. It doesn't seem to work very well. And the point that Shakespeare keeps making, it seems, is that uh, you're misreading this. Uh, you really don't know what nature is telling you. There's a very strange moment on page 29, which to this day I don't really understand, but I'll refer you to it uh, because it is so odd. So this is Act 2, Scene 1, uh, about line 100. Uh, in the signet edition. Uh, now, this is a stage device here. Shakespeare wants Brutus and Cassius to go off and kind of whisper to each other uh, and settle their questions and then come back ready to go ahead with the conspiracy. And so you have to picture this being staged that Brutus and Cassius, we're really interested in what they're saying to each other, yet they've wandered off backstage. And instead, we get this strange dialogue uh, uh, with the remaining characters. Here lies the east. Doth not the day break here? No. Oh, pardon, sir, it doth. And yon gray lines that fret the clouds are messengers of the day. You shall confess that you were both deceived. Here, as I point my sword, the sun arises, which is a great way growing on the south, weighing the youthful season of the year. Some two months hence, up higher towards the north, he first presents his fire, and the high east stands as the capital directly here. And then Brutus and Cassius come stage forward, and the conspiracy goes into high gear. Uh, and what in the world is going on in here in this dialogue? And again, I confess, I, to this day, I don't fully understand it. But it does seem to be discussion of the city's attempt to orient itself by nature and its failure at doing so because the city tries to remain constant and nature keeps changing. What this is talking about is where does, where does the sun arise in relation to the Capitol building? You know all these stories about Stonehenge. You know, on the summer solstice, the sun arises in just the way that illuminates one of the stones. Or there's all these things about Mayan temples and, and the Egyptian pyramids. Uh, you got to watch the History Channel to see all this stuff. Uh, but these ideas that these great monuments are built to be aligned with the heavens. So on this one day, uh, the, 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 the light of the sun strikes this one part of the monument and reveals the ancient Mayan prophecy of the destruction of the world. Uh, now, you know, one day, <laughs> there's only one day uh, uh, when nature aligns with this human convention in the building. That seems to be the force of the passage here. Uh, uh, that there's, you know, right now, that's not where the sun arises. 
but later it will arise there because it's aligned with our capital. Uh, uh, I should say there's an interesting theory about this dialogue here. As you may know, Julius Caesar reformed uh, the Roman calendar, which resulted in events being sort of two weeks out of whack once he uh, uh, put in the new calendar. And some people have related that to, to this. I'm, I'm not sure of that. But in any case, what I'm getting at here is there are these moments uh, when the citizens of Rome now try to align the city and their lives with something that goes beyond Rome, a storm in the heavens where the sun arises. None of this went on in Coriolanus. And what we do see in the play is that alignment doesn't work, uh, that somehow nature is more complex or complicated or at least more variable the city is. You know, they don't have a rotating capital building. That's what we do now, where every day the sun uh, hits the statue of Julius Caesar or something. Uh, uh, and because of that, they have to, their buildings remain fixed, but the sun keeps rising at different points, and the city grows out of alignment with nature here. That's my sense here. Any questions about that? Uh, okay, so uh, I mentioned Cicero. Here's another way in which Rome has changed. Uh, uh, namely, there's now philosophy in Rome. Uh, and indeed, uh, uh, what, a, what do we learn about Cicero when we first hear about him? This is on page 16. Uh, so Act 1, Scene 2. Again, when Casca is giving his uh, account of what happened uh, when Mark Anthony presented the crown, uh, Cassius says, did Cicero say anything? I, he spoke Greek, to what effect? Nay, and I tell you that, I'll never look you in the face again. But those that understood him smiled at one another and shook their heads. But for mine own part, it was Greek to me. Very famous line that's actually become a proverb in our language. But what the hell is Cicero speaking Greek for in Rome? Something's really happened to our poor Roman Republic. Uh, if this distinguished statesman is going around speaking in Greek, would Coriolanus have done that? No. He had great contempt for all Greek things. Uh, uh, you know, he said, you want to give out grain, as was sometimes done in Greece. Uh, uh, and he, he says about there, the Roman Senate, it's a greater magistracy than ever uh, uh, sat in Greece and so on. Coriolanus, as a good Roman, uh, had complete contempt for Greek things. Uh, uh, and what you see in this play is the Greekification of Rome. Uh, uh, that, that, uh, now again, Rome, Rome conquered Greece militarily, conquered the Greek peoples uh, uh, in the East. Uh, but as many people have pointed out, it was a kind of Pyrrhic victory something we're going to see in comparison to the Roman treatment of Egypt in Antony and Cleopatra, that you might conquer a people militarily and yet lose to them culturally. Uh, and indeed, the Romans, especially the Patricians, were overawed by the great Greek civilization they encountered when they took over cities like Corinth uh, and uh, uh, Athens. In fact, uh, they started, the Romans started sending their children to be educated in Athens. Uh, I mentioned that rhetoric was very important in Republican Rome and the great schools of rhetoric were still in Athens. Uh, and uh, the young Ovid, the poet, was sent to Athens to become a lawyer, basically, and he decided he'd be a poet instead. Uh, that's, there's corruption for you right there. Uh, so the Romans tried to absorb Greek culture uh, and again, I, I showed you in Virgil that, that in the Aeneid, he wanted to suggest the superiority of Rome to, to the Greeks because Rome would, be, would rule nations and all the Greeks did was build beautiful strat statues and solve mathematical theorems. But you, you see what's happened. There's a kind of split developing in Rome here that yes, they're Romans, but they are being influenced by... Uh, Greek things, uh, they're speaking Greek, and to the extent you're speaking Greek, you're not so Roman anymore. And one of the most distinctive ways 
in which this manifests itself in the play is the presence of philosophy uh, in uh, the Rome of Julius Caesar. Uh, there are no philosophers in the world of Coriolanus, uh, but in this play, uh, uh, there are characters who identify with specific philosophies. I've already shown you, and we'll go back to this, that Cassius uh, uh, is an Epicurean. Brutus, as we'll see in a minute, is a Stoic. Uh, there is Cicero in the play. Uh, Cicero, who was, um, to put a label on him, people often say he was an academic skeptic, but he certainly was a, a student of Plato and deeply influenced by Plato. He wrote his own Republic and his own laws, for example. He was in some ways imitating uh, Plato. Uh, and, you know, so this is, say this is wonderful about Rome. Uh, they got all these philosophers uh, in it. They're, they're so much more educated. They're so much more sophisticated, and that's true. Uh, but that sophistication is also a form of decadence. And that's, again, here's the logic of what I'm calling the tragedy of the Republic, that its very success undermines the basis of its success. And here's an example. Uh, the, the Roman Republic, in its late years, such as we're seeing in Julius Caesar, became increasingly cosmopolitan as a result of its exposure to foreign ways of life. You know, the only... If, the only thing Coriolanus was exposed to in terms of foreign ways of life was a couple of Etruscans and a bunch of Volskis. Uh, and, you know, you don't see any Etruscans in the play, but uh, they're not all that different. And we certainly see that the Volskis are not all that different. Coriolanus doesn't go to Antium and study philosophy with some transposed Greek there. Uh, and it's one of the reasons why he remains a Roman to the end and can't think his way out of that dilemma that his mother places him in. Uh, he says there is a world elsewhere, but he never really finds a fundamentally different world. Now the Romans are beginning to find worlds elsewhere as Rome expands. And they start encountering genuinely foreign ways of life. We will see this above all in Antony Cleopatra. But it's implied already in Julius Caesar when you realize that they are, are uh, if nothing else, being exposed to, to very un-Roman ways of life, and philosophy is a very un-Roman way of life. If you think of that passage in Virgil, I mean, you know, what are Romans destined to do? To conquer the world and rule it. Rule it justly. Uh, but in that passage in the Aeneid, Virgil actually contrasts Romans with these Greek scientists and philosophers who study the world. Now, specifically, let's talk a bit about these philosophies uh, we, we see in the play. Uh, Epicureanism in the case of Cassius, Stoicism in the case of, of, of uh, uh, Brutus. Uh, uh, Epicureanism has gotten a bad name. It's now associated with eating and drinking a lot. Uh, but Epicurus... Uh, when, when he said uh, human beings should live a life of pleasure, he really meant intellectual pleasure, ultimately. Uh, but in any case, the thing I want to stress about these two philosophies, and again, this is very unusual in Shakespeare. It's arguably the only place in Shakespeare where characters are identified with a named philosophy. Uh, uh, let's see, Hamlet uh, uh, speaks of Horatio's philosophy without specifying what it is. This is very unusual. Uh, uh, and now, both Epicureanism and Stoicism are, in a way, anti political philosophies, in this sense that what they are telling people is that politics is not the highest thing in human life, which in a way is the claim of Republican Rome. Uh, and Epicurus's philosophy, I mean, as I said, one thing he said was that if the gods exist, they ignore us, they're not interested in human affairs, they don't intervene in human affairs. Uh, and his conclusion from that was what one should do is withdraw uh, from politics and just uh, enjoy yourself, though again, his conception of enjoy, uh, of en of enjoyment was not one of sensual self-indulgence. 
indulgence as has become identified with the word Epicureanism today. It was chiefly intellectual pleasure uh, he had in mind. These are philosophies that developed among the Greeks. Uh, Epicurus was a a Greek... (laughs) Uh, Mr. Stoic was not, uh, the Stoicism comes from uh, the Stoa, the, the uh, place where these certain Greek philosophers uh, met. Uh, and Stoicism we actually associate with the Romans because it's a philosophy that became very popular, uh, ultimately with the, the Roman emperor Marcus Aurelius, who's one of the great Stoic philosophers. Uh, uh, and Stoicism actually became compatible uh, with being a Roman, again, here's Marcus Aurelius, a great Roman emperor, the Stoic. Uh, but what Stoicism claimed was emperor or slave, it didn't matter. If you were a slave, you should be content with being a slave. If you were emperor, you should be content with being an emperor. But you shouldn't strive to become an emperor. That's how it was possible for Marcus Aurelius, a Roman emperor, to be a Stoic. It was a philosophy that basically tried to teach people to live their duty in whatever station of life uh, they were in. In that sense, it was very different from the Roman sense of ambitious politics where everything that mattered was striving to be first. Uh, So what I'm getting at is it's very interesting that Cassius should be an Epicurean and Brutus should be a Stoic. Because this is not uh, right for political men. Uh, Now, in fact, uh, what Shakespeare shows is uh, Cassius is not a true Epicurean and Brutus is not a true Stoic. Uh, But the mere fact that they're attracted to these philosophies shows something is going haywire uh, in the Roman regime. Uh, Now, Caesar understands this well. And again, I I, want to show you how Eros and Thumos uh, comes up Uh, in this uh, uh, play. It's on page 13. Uh, uh, This is Act 1, Scene 2. Uh, So about uh, uh, line uh, uh, 191, very famous exchange between Caesar uh, and Mark Antony. Uh, Let me have men about me that are fat, sleek-headed men in such a sleep of nights. Young Cassius has a lean and hungry look. He thinks too much. Such men are dangerous. Fear him not, Caesar. He's not dangerous. He's a noble Roman and well-given. Would he were fatter. But I fear him not. Yet if my name were liable to fear, I do not know the man I should avoid so soon as that spare Cassius. He reads much. He's a great observer, and he looks quite through the deeds of men. He loves no plays as thou dost, Antony. He hears no music. Seldom he smiles, and smiles in such a sort as if he mocked himself and scorned his spirit that could be moved to smile at anything. Such men as he be never at heart's ease whilst they behold a greater than themselves, and therefore are they very dangerous. Now, it's amazing that Shakespeare didn't come up with this. If you've got the signet, you can turn to page 114 uh, and see <coughs> it's, it's right uh, at the top there. Uh, Caesar also had Cassius in great jealousy and suspected him much. Whereupon he said on a time to his friends, What will Cassius do, think you? I like not his pale looks. Uh, <coughs> another time when Caesar's friends complained unto him, Antonius and Dolabella, that they pretended some mischief towards him, he answered them again, As for those fat men and smooth comrades, quoth he, I never reckoned of them. <coughs> but these pale visitors and Caroline people, I fear them most, meaning Brutus and Cassius. It's stunning to find out that Shakespeare had that in his source. And actually, Plutarch likes that so much. It's in the life of Julius Caesar, it's in the life of Marcus Brutus, and it's in the life of Marcus Antonius. So Shakespeare couldn't possibly have missed it. <coughs> but still, uh, he, you know, his heart must have leapt when he saw that, uh, because uh, what he's got here is exactly the distinction between Eros and Thumos. Uh, and Caesar trusts erotic men and a deep distrust, thumonic man. <coughs> and again, the symbolism is quite apt. Lean men are unerotic. Uh, fat men are like Meninius. They crave food <coughs> and tell fables of the belly. Uh, but Shakespeare associates the dangerous men, the ambitious men, precisely with thumos uh, <coughs> and the lack of interest in food. Anger is my meat. I sup upon myself, as Volumnius says. Uh, and so you see here exactly, actually, this is, 
we really see the connection, we start to see here something we need to work out, <coughs> the connection between the Republic and Thumas uh, and the Empire and Eros. We see here the start of the imperial policy, which is to encourage Eros in order to discourage Thumos. Uh, Caesar is already saying, I like men who like plays, who like music, <coughs> who can uh, you know, enjoy some food. Uh, if they are engaged in erotic activities, they'll leave politics alone. Uh, and contrarywise, Caesar very aptly sees the defenders of the Republic are these men in the grip of Thumas. Uh, scorned his spirit that could be moved to smile at anything. Such men as he be never at heart's ease was the beholder greater than themselves. And we indeed see that with Cassius uh, in the play. So we see, you know, the political men are the men in the, gr in the grip of Thumas here. Uh, uh, Anthony, by the way, had an incredible reputation for reveling and indulging in the pleasures of the flesh. It's all over Plutarch. It's actually much stronger in Plutarch than, in, 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 than it is in Shakespeare. But here we have, the author, what are these Thumatic men, Brutus and Cassius, doing having philosophies? Uh, what are they doing being Epicureans uh, and Stoics when those philosophies are the very antithesis of political ambition? Uh, again, both Epicureanism and Stoicism uh, work enormously to moderate ambition, uh, uh, to tell you that uh, the political life is not the be-all and the end-all of human life. Now, it's interesting, I think, that when Shakespeare shows political men with philosophies, I think he's trying to show that those philosophies are only skin deep, uh, that they really are, are not in the grip of these philosophies, that they are not working them out uh, to their fullest. Now, in Cash's case, case let's go back uh, 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 we uh, saw this scene that's on uh, page 92, I believe it is. Uh, but now you'll see the fuller sense of this speech uh, uh, here. This is Act 5, Scene 1, uh, where Cassius refers to his Epicureanism, line 76, you know that I held Epicurus strong in his opinion. Now I change my mind and partly credit things that do presage, coming from Sardis uh, on our former ensign, two mighty eagles fell, uh, uh, and there uh, they perched, gorging and feeding from our soldiers' hands, uh, 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 Philippi, Hickensaurus. So, in fact, his Epicureanism is bleeding away uh, at this point. Uh, his sense that the gods are indifferent. Now he's beginning to believe in omens. So how deep did his Epicureanism uh, really uh, run? Now in Brutus's case, uh, uh, it's an even more interesting portrayal that Shakespeare gives. One of the strangest things in the play puzzled many people, but I think we can uh, work it out. This is on page 81, uh, where... Uh, Brutus and Cassius have been quarreling. Uh, so it's Act 4, Scene 3, about line uh, 140. Act 4, 3, Scene, about 140. And uh, uh, they're trying to reconcile here. And Cassius says, I did not think you could have been so angry. Oh, Cassius, I'm sick of many griefs. Of your philosophy, you make no use if you give place to accidental evils. Ha, no man bears sorrow better Portia is dead. Now here again, uh, here Cassius is attributing a philosophy to Brutus. It is Stoicism, as your very notes point out, uh, and the reference to accidental evils nails that down, because the uh, idea that, you know, uh, uh, none of your injuries go to the essence of yourself, that's very Stoic. Uh, uh, you should rise above injuries because uh, whether you lose an arm or lose a wife, or what, those are just accidents. They don't touch upon the core of your being. Again, that's Stoic philosophy. Uh, the word Stoic is not used in this play, but it's very clear uh, that uh, we're being shown here that, that Brutus is a Stoic. Uh, and uh, notice, I mean, what Cassius points out 
is, it seems to him Brutus has failed to live up to his philosophy. Uh, indeed, he's shown a lot of thumas in the scene, a lot of collar is the word that's used in the scene, a lot of anger in the scene. They're both very contentious alpha males in the scene. And so Cassius says, you know, you, uh, if you're giving into grief, that's not very stoic. And Brutus says, well, well, you know, Portia's dead. Now, in fact, a stoic ought to say, Portia's dead, big deal. I move on. Uh, and the amazing thing is Brutus says that later in the scene. This is now on page 83. Act 4, scene 3, about line 187, uh, where Bruce keeps asking about his wife. Uh, 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 excuse me, uh, Masala's asking him if he's heard anything from his wife here. And Brutus doesn't, this is the top of 83, it's about line 180, he doesn't say, She's dead. How could I have heard from her? He says, no, Masala. Nor nothing in your letters read of her? Nothing, Masala. That methinks is strange. Why ask you? Have you, hear you aught of her and yours? No, my lord. Now as you a Roman, tell me true. Then like a Roman, bear the truth I tell, for certain she is dead and by strange manner. Why, farewell, Portia. We must die, Masala. Why, meditating that she must die once, I have the patience to endure it now. Even so, great men, great losses should endure. Cassius says, I have as much of this in art as you, but yet my nature could not bear it so well to our work alive. This is Shakespeare at his most extraordinary here. So extraordinary that many editors can't believe it. Uh, because this is referred to as the double revelation of Portia's death in Shakespearean criticism. Because what in the world is happening here? Uh, two pages earlier, we know that Brutus knows that Portia's dead. He is using it as an excuse for his anger. And I really, you know, excuse me, I've had a lot of griefs, Portia's dead. Uh, and now he stages in public the scene a Stoic ought to act. He indeed almost invites it here. Uh, you know, he could have cut the conversation short by saying, look, I know she's dead. Uh, but instead, he, uh, he forces Masala to make this revelation. Now, as you are a Roman, tell me true. And then exactly what he's anticipating. Then like a Roman bear the truth I tell, for certain she is dead and by strange manner. And then he plays the perfect Stoic. Why, farewell, Portia, we must die, Masala, with meditating that she must die once. Uh, I have the patience to endure it now. And this has precisely the effect that Brutus wants it to have, uh, that he becomes admirable. Uh, Masala says, even so, great men, great losses should endure. And Cassius does not say, as I would say in the circumstances, what the hell is going on here? Just two minutes ago, you told me she was dead and that it bothered you. No, Cassius catches on pretty quickly here uh, that uh, this is a good photo op. Uh, this is a great opportunity to score some points here uh, with the troops, what great leaders we are. And so he says, uh, you know, oh, I couldn't do that. Man, you're fantastic, uh, uh, Mr. Brutus here. Uh, now, again, I want to say that many uh, Shakespeare uh, editors uh, omit one of these two passages. Uh, and they claim that Shakespeare changed his mind, uh, that first he was going to have Brutus uh, show he was affected by Portia's death, and then he wanted to have Brutus show he was unaffected, and that the people... Remember, Shakespeare did not see his plays uh, into print. Uh, this play... Uh, I think first he's printed the first folio, which makes it 1623. Shakespeare died in 1616. And so the idea is people had these so-called foul papers. Uh, that's what the, the uh, uh, editors refer to them. They just had Shakespeare's manuscript, and it was a mess, and they didn't see he'd crossed out one or two scenes, and the stupid printers printed them both. Well, that's possible, and if you read any of these critics, you'll see there you actually can omit one or the other without losing anything necessary to the dialogue. Still, it seems to me this is a real coup on Shakespeare's part, and it's consistent with what he's showing uh, elsewhere in the play, that people's philosophies are an act, uh, that they don't run deep. 
uh, that here's this Roman Cassius who claims to be an Epicurean, but when push comes to shove, he starts believing in omens. Here's Brutus who claims to be a Stoic, uh, uh, but yet is actually, as any human being ought to be, deeply affected by the death of his wife, but feels a need to stage in public that he is a Stoic. You could say Brutus is making political use of his philosophy here that he's taking an apolitical philosophy and putting it to political use. Who knows if that's what Marcus Aurelius was actually doing. Uh, but it is interesting that, I mean, in, in, on so many levels, uh, what we're seeing here. By the way, uh, uh, there's another mention of philosophy on page 80, when this poet breaks in, uh, this is Act 4, Scene 3, uh, Act 4, Scene 3, about line uh, 131, uh, w when this poet tries to break in and reconcile uh, Brutus and Cassius, Cassius says, how violent does the, the, the cynic rhyme? And cynicism was another Greek philosophy, as shown by its name. Stoicism is the Greek word stoa for porch. Uh, uh, cynicism comes from the Greek word kune, which means dog. Uh, <laughs> Epicurus is just a Greek name. Uh, but three Greek philosophies mentioned in the play, four if you count Cicero, uh, uh, and they're all kind of weird in Republican Rome. That's what I'm trying to suggest, that you see something has really changed in this world. If these, <laughs> just imagine Coriolanus in a philosophy seminar. I mean, that, that doesn't compute, that's not Roman. But something's happened here, so that even the, the uh, uh, spirited men, the Thumonic men, the lean men like Cassius and Brutus, they've adapted to these strange anti-political, anti-Thumonic philosophies uh, that counsel renouncing <coughs> public life for pleasure or uh, 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 re renouncing struggle and contest and uh, not being worried about accidental evils in the case of Stoicism. Cynicism is just what you think it is. It's cynicism. The, the cynics despise all politics as well. It's very interesting. Uh, on the one hand, that the, th the three philosophies, Stoicism, Epicureanism, and Cynicism, are all in one way or another apolitical or antipolitical philosophies, and, and Cicero's academic skepticism would count that way too. And yet, in all the cases, uh, even this minor poet, uh, the philosopher, these people, so-called philosophers, actually are quite political men. That's obviously true of Cicero, Bruce, and Cassius. The uh, poet is trying to use uh, to reconcile Brutus and Cassius. And in that sense, it's a political act. By the way, uh, uh, he is a poet in Plutarch. He's not a cynic, uh, as I recall, that, that Shakespeare introduces that. So uh, we're seeing all these foreign philosophies introduced in the Roman Republic. Uh, in a way, though, it is superficial. Uh, <clears throat> it is a kind of act, as we see in the case of uh, of Brutus's Stoicism, these people are not truly philosophic. Maybe Cicero is, uh, but the, uh, Brutus and Cassius certainly not. Uh, their philosophies uh, collapse in the face of real-world events. So on the one hand, we're seeing Rome, another example of Rome corrupted. Uh, the Roman Republic in Coriolanus' day is narrow horizons. You don't encounter Greek philosophy in Coriolanus' world. Now, in fact, uh, Rome has really been changed. Uh, its statues are now marble copies of Greek bronzes. Uh, its poetry is copies of Greek epics. I mean, Virgil's a little later than these events, but there was this guy, Ennius, who'd already written an epic poem. And in general, Roman poetry copies Greek poetry. Roman architecture copies Greek architecture. The Romans are changed and begin to become un-Roman in certain ways. And again, the most fundamental manifestation of that is they're becoming philosophic in very un-Roman ways. And yet they're still Romans and they still uh, put the philosophy uh, uh, to political uses. Uh, it's a kind of internal contradiction that's emerging in the regime, one of many. This is what happens to the Republic as it grows to conquer the whole world. It starts to absorb influences from around the world. In another simple way, it's just corrupted by all this wealth 
it's gained from conquering the world, all this grain that's pouring into Rome, all this gold and silver. Uh, the city can't maintain that austere, tough, disciplined Republican way of life, in part because it just doesn't have to uh, anymore. Back in Coriolanus, and you can look this up on, in your edition, it's again in, Shakespeare, in, in, in Plutarch, uh, uh, where Plutarch's talking about the relation of the Romans uh, to the Volskis. Uh, uh, it's on page, again, 170 in your volume of Coriolanus. And they levied out all the rest that remained in the city of Rome, a great number to go against the Volskis, hoping by the mean of foreign war to pacify their sedition at home. Uh, Plutarch's explicit about this, Machiavelli is explicit about it, that one of the patrician policies was to use foreign wars to divert the plebeians' attention from their complaints about patrician rule. You see that, in effect, operating uh, in Coriolanus. One of the strange things in Coriolanus is how easily the Romans make peace with the Volskis. Uh, uh, the Volskis are convinced that they'll get their towns back. Why? Because in some ways it's deeply in the interest of the Roman patricians to keep the Volskis as enemies. Think of the image of young Martius chasing those butterflies. He caught them, let them go. Caught them, let him go. Caught them, let him go. When he finally caught him and didn't let it go, he killed the butterfly, and that was the end of the game. That's a kind of prophecy, I think, of the history of the Roman Republic, uh, that when they caught the Volskis and let them go, caught the Volskis and let them go, they were maintaining these enemies as a diversion from domestic complaints, that as long as the patricians had enemies, they could pacify the plebeians, uh, get them to have faith in the patricians as their only salvation. Uh, in a way, in Martius's little story, you see the problem for Rome if it ever definitively wins. And in the world of Julius Caesar, they're really close to definitive winning, uh, definitively winning. We'll see in Antony and Cleopatra that they really do finally win. Uh, defeating all its enemies seems like the dream of the Republic. And yet, in some ways, it spelled its doom uh, because it diverted a lot. Uh, it ended this technique of diverting the plebeians. So, any last, any last minute question? Yes. Yeah, four and fifty. Years. Yeah. Do you mean that basically? And they uh, go and uh, just uh, take uh, some part of ancient Greek uh, philosophy and try to imitate it, but in a very bad manner. Yes. Yeah. I mean, that's not unprecedented in human history. Uh, and you might look at much of American culture in relation to European culture to understand that. Uh, or even, I might say, look at the, the Ottoman Empire and its relation to the Byzantine Empire. There are many points in history where a conqueror adopted the culture of the so-called conquered because it was manifestly superior. You know, once you've seen Greek philosophy, why bother develop Roman philosophy? I got to tell you. Anyway, okay, we'll, we'll keep coming back to that point, but that's a very good question.